Welcome to Smarter Cities with me, Jason D'Souza. Artificial intelligence, friend or foe in developing stronger, more productive and equitable economies and societies. Well, joining me to debate this question is Accenture's Head of Applied Intelligence, Kelly Bruff. Kelly Bruff, welcome to Smarter Cities. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's a real pleasure. It's a pretty exciting time to be talking about this topic since everyone seems to be talking about it. And particularly since you are the head of applied intelligence, so you might be able to tell us what it's all about. So it's a good way for me to start on that. How on earth does one become the head of applied intelligence? What got you into this? Well, look, I mean, for me, I guess I've been pretty... Um, pretty interested in technology since I was really small. And I, you know, sort of made my way through lots of different waves of technology and innovation. And as the, you know, internet made a wealth of data available to, uh, to the world, really, I built my career on how do we turn that into products and uh, consumer services. And from there, I have uh, continued to grow my career. I joined Accenture about two and a half years ago, and um, I'm, I'm really lucky to be uh, working in such an awesome organization and, you know, have had such an amazing technology to help our clients make sense of. So what, what are you finding in your office space? Are you finding people are more Tuesday to Thursday or is it more spread? And I'll, I'll give you an example for us. I mean, what we found is that, yes, Tuesdays to Thursdays have heavier periods of time, but we still have lots of activity on Monday and Fridays, largely because our business is a, a sort of a mix of things, right? De development and construction investment has a lot of front of house people. All of those guys are in, right? Because cities are about creating things. And you know, most people who are front end oriented, like I am, are about creating things. So you're in. A lot of people, however, like to be at home uh, if their job sort of involves more computer based work and they're comfortable at home and they stay, stay back a bit more. So we're trying hard to think about how to configure workspaces that uh, allow allow that hybrid working in a way that if you are at home, you are not somehow separated from the office. You're not separated from your colleagues. And I think culturally, interestingly enough, you know, I couldn't, I, you know, remember the old days of uh, the conference call where you'd go on, you know, and someone's joined, you know, David has joined the call and it interrupts the whole <laughs> meeting, right? Um, and, and everyone used to go, let's just get rid of David because he's at home and who cares, right? We'll just have this meeting. Now you find it's very much a mixed meeting. People are on video. There are large screens in the room. It's almost, it's almost a version of telepresence um, back in the day when we imagined telepresence. In fact, this was actually a telepresence suite at one point, um, which it no longer is. Um, what are you finding in a technology business? Well, I guess, you know, one of the things that, you know, most of our business, and I think we all proved this out during uh, during the COVID period, most of our business is, is possible to be done remotely. Mm. But we do see that um, that our people are coming back to the office. They come in particularly to collaborate, though I think uh, there's also some demographic differences in okay. the behavior. So we tend to find that our uh, younger team members tend to be the ones who are uh, coming in on Fridays and uh, quite a bit on Thursdays so that they're ending their day in the CBD and able to socialize with friends mm. afterwards which we're presuming, I guess, our data doesn't tell us that, but um, a little, a little hypothesizing never, uh, never hurt. But, um, but equally, we're able to, uh, we're seeing some behaviors in the building where um, we do a lot of our work on site with clients. So people will go to client site uh, possibly one day a week rather than the whole week, and and come into our office and work remotely with their clients, mm. uh, but from within the office. And I've had a number of people say to me, one of their biggest challenges is when the office is crowded, their clients can't hear them because everyone's yes. on conference calls. Because everyone's on conference calls. Yeah. So I think that's a you know that's a, a new challenge that in the future hybrid environment we'll we'll need to start thinking about as we think about uh, the structure of a workplace. It's funny our, our workplace designers have have created this phone booth mm. that sort of you know we have now all over the office where people can go in and make. A team's call, right? It's got a little desk in it. You can uh, you can sit in it and make a team's call. 
And when it first arrived, the first thing I could think of was Superman. I thought Superman's going to jump out of this phone booth, right? <laughs> and, and of course, you know, that you, I just didn't think anyone would really want to hang out in this tiny little phone booth for hours on end. Not my style, but hey, team members seem to love yeah. it. And they're all in there, they're all on the phone. And, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, walk around the place on the phone type person. So I tend to extract myself from the building altogether and go and walk outside um, to, to avoid, uh, you know, interfering with my colleagues. But then we also have, we also have these sort of other sort of pod-like things that have been developed that look almost like a, a business class style seat, right? Where you sat down, you've got your screen in front of you and you can, you can work and they, they have proved quite successful also. So I think that problem that you're alluding to, which is your client can't hear you because you're, you know, in a room full of people yelling um, at a team's call or whatever software one might use um, is, is an interesting problem. And we know, what we're finding as designers of new buildings is that those that are looking at the, the future of office are saying, well, you know, I want a situation where my staff can work in a hybrid format, where they can be in the office, have those corridor conversations, train those young people, do the sort of team building cultural stuff that we need to do to be a successful company, but also have um, have a hybrid working with, with team schools. And actually one of the arguments I've actually put forward is this isn't actually new because any company that has worked globally is used to talking to your office in New York or your office in London or, or wherever that might be, right? I mean, Accenture's 90 million times bigger than we are, but we're in 14 cities and we have four regions, so we're constantly on calls with our with our regional colleagues. So it's not, perhaps it's not a new concept, but I think it's just an intensified concept. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think um, I think that the the presence of being on video when you join those remote environments actually um, it, it it brings a different dimension, mm. so that. Um, for, for sure, that connectivity is easier, right? And you know the the closeness. One of the things that um, that we notice is sometimes we have been working with people who live in your same city, and you never really realized, <laughs> right? So I think there's I think there's some some nuance like that that yeah. um, that is is also really interesting. And you know you you could be equally working with someone in you know in India and someone in Sydney and. If you only ever see them on the screen, you don't always necessarily appreciate yeah, where, they are. Uh, where they're where they're uh, coming from. So, I think you know there is a lot to discover, and you know, I do tend to always you know anchor in a combination of what does your instinct tell you and how does the data back that up. And so I think that's where you know as we move through the next couple of years, we'll do a lot of of experimenting, you know, with with how we work, with how we motivate people. And I think also, you know, for ourselves, how we reestablish our boundaries. Mm. Because I think one of the other things that, um, yeah. you know, we, we don't necessarily spend enough time on is the, you know, the choices that people make, whether to be present or <laughs> whether to, mm. to be at home. And, you know, some of that is is convenience and comfort and so forth. And, and some of that is a little bit out of necessity. And so how do mm. we start to find the right, um, the right policies? How do we ensure we're not leaving anyone behind, that we're being inclusive, that, um, you know, that, that we set a set of policies that is uh, appropriately fair and equitable for a blend of personality types, a blend of personal personal circumstances, but yet still focused on getting the job done. Because at the end mm. of the day, um, you know, we, we're we all businesses with a, you know, commercial objective as well. Well, that's, that's right. And it's interesting, you know, this whole people and culture, which is the modern phrase of human resources, I suppose, is, is that this element of it is fascinating. This earn the commute concept when we first started hearing about it, it was, well, why would you come to the office? You know, is it because there's a social gathering or a, um, I think Bill Rue calls it the event attender. Is it the event attender, right? Um, is it a, is it some form of other activity that you want to do? But I wasn't hearing work. I wasn't coming to the office to work, right? Which is, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm starting to show my age here because I thought that was the concept of coming to the <laughs> office, right? But 
Having said that, I've, I've started modifying my thinking on this because the, in designing a precinct or designing a place, we're starting to realize that actually, yes, work is one of those things, but you want your mind to be clear of the other things in your life that might be worrying you. So where are my children? Like, are they in childcare? Is there appropriate childcare in a precinct? Um, and, you know, my son used to go to the preschool here. It was a great preschool. You know, he, he was there. We used to, you know, pick him up in the evening, drop him off in the morning. He was part of our work routine. Like, um, and that was great. Right. So that's one less thing to worry about. Right. Um, is how does it work with school sessions? Right. You know, they, when I first started, you know, there was never an idea that I might be able to drop my kids off at school or pick them up. Right. It's mostly dropping off these days um, because, of course, you'd be at work at eight o'clock. Now it's now. Well, actually, I can be on the phone at eight o'clock and I can have them in the car. And if I have them in the car, they'll say hello to my colleagues and so now all of a sudden you're getting to know your colleagues children in one way or the other maybe you see them on video every so often which changes the whole dynamic of how you relate to to one another and particularly i find with my clients if they see my children on a call it it changes the whole dynamic of the conversation because they too are human they too have children they too um have things so i think there's some, some interesting dynamics that have come about as a result of video and working from home. So I'm curious, I know you're the question asker, but no, I'm no, curious you ask, what, your, uh, what yeah. your, your point of view is on, do you think that that is a leveler in terms of the gender dynamic and the opportunity for women to have a level playing field with men during those years of caring for children? Or do you think there's still uh, a meaningful gender wow. gap? Um, so I think, yes, I think it's definitely a leveler and I'll, I'll respond by saying this, another guest, Richard Kupasami, who came on this show and is an amazing guy. He, um, he's in a wheelchair, right? And he said, one of the things that he always found when we were meeting in physical environments is that he'd be in a wheelchair and he'd turn up and he's one of the most able guys I've ever seen, right? Um, but you know he's permanently in this wheelchair and he uh people would say oh he's in a wheelchair and you know that would be the conversation on screen no one knows he's on a wheelchair so in a wheelchair so for him he felt that actually video democratized mm. the workplace which is a term he used on this show which it's just not a concept i'd really thought of and what you've just said on the gender side i hadn't really thought of it that way either that it was a a leveler um, but I, I think in a way it is because I think if I look at my own circumstances where I get to be at home a little bit more now because I'm not worried necessarily about being present for an internal meeting at eight o'clock and I can drop the kids off at school, that means that's something, that's something that I get to do and my wife doesn't have to do it. Um, similarly, when she has meetings and she's got priorities, I can step in and, mm. and work. So if, at least from our personal circumstances, it's improved it's improved things for us. I think it's improved things for her and, and I together because I get more time with my kids and she gets more time, you know, to manage herself as well. If you're asking me, are women far more competent than men on these matters? I think that is true also. So, and I'm <laughs> well, had, open, I, had I known I'm we were going to get there, I would, I would have definitely started there. But, I'm um, open to admitting that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I but think... What do you think? Do you think, do you think it's a level? Uh, I hope so. Yeah. I actually think it's a complex issue. And I think that the thing I'm concerned about as we reinvent the workplace a little bit is that the, um, the that there's an imbalance on women staying home more because of children and that having an ah, adverse yeah, okay. impact. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that that's not what will happen, but I'm very conscious of that possibility. But I do think that seeing mothers and fathers have children as a real part of their life and a connection to their whole self absolutely makes a positive Im impact for everyone. So I'm going to qualify my remarks based on that because that is a risk, right, of, mm. of women staying at home to the extent that they can become completely disconnected from exactly. decision-making and therefore are not part of the, 
of the future of things and they sort of just get pigeonholed into, um, how do I put it, I guess, operational jobs, right? You know, this person's in this task, they do a very good job of that task. You know, why would we want to move Jane from that role? Because she's doing a great job and, oh, she's at home anyway, right? There is that risk. I don't, I don't, and I, I will extend that by saying I have been probably more worried in a way about our younger, uh, our younger kids, yeah, they're adults obviously, but I call them kids probably inappropriately, but uh, they, you know, they, and you remember when we were young, you thrive off being around older people, yeah. you thrive off experience, you thrive off making mistakes and learning why you've made those, uh, those mistakes. And uh, actually, I'm glad you reminded me because I was talking to a bunch of lawyers um, a few weeks ago, and one of the managing partners said to me of this firm, their biggest concern was that uh, all the partners are staying at home, they're at home, they've got nice houses, home offices, you know, gear yep. galore. It's a very comfortable lifestyle. They're farming out the work to all of their, um, of, uh, to their, their workforce. If they have a meeting, you know, they live in wherever, they can just say they've got a cafe of choice. Their client happens to also live in the same suburb. They'll bicycle there. <laughs> and, you know, after bicycling there, can, you know, have coffee and then go back to their various offices and farm out the work, which means that the workforce in that case aren't actually getting any interface with the senior executives, right, with the partners. And that was destroying the culture in that firm. That was that that particular yeah. managing partner's view. So I think there is a real risk that if we don't look at this new hybrid workforce thing in the right way, that young people will not get the development opportunities that they should get mm. in a, a world where we're sort of getting fewer and fewer young people coming through and we need them to perform at yeah. their best, right? And and I think that also extends to the, the gender question, which is, you know, I, I think it's it's been long established that you can't you can't exclude fifty percent of the population from today's economy, right? Or, or workforce actually it's higher than fifty percent. So there are yeah. more women than men, um, and generally what you find is that there are there are women who can get through the, the sort of process and, and manage their uh, manage their circumstances so they can be in both places but others who can't, and those that, who can't are the ones that we've got to watch out for and make sure we build infrastructure around them so they can participate properly in the workplace. And I'm not a workplace expert, I will say this right now, um, but I am worried about these issues. But I think that, you know, the topic that we started on around the role of AI is part of the solution. Yeah, so right? tell me about that. As I was listening to you, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about as we think about the role, particularly of generative AI, and we're starting to, you know, explore with lots of different clients across lots of different industries where, um, you know, where the impacts will be and what they need to be doing in their business. We talk a lot about the talent and in particular about younger talent, because one of the areas where, you um, in particular, the large language models that are, you know, people are experimenting with right now, you know, chat GPT mm. and, um, you know, as a consumer instance of, you know, uh, of those models are knowledge workers and, you know, a lot of that kind of analytical type judgment oriented um, work is being accelerated and augmented by this technology. Mm. And uh, I was I was talking to someone in the legal field actually uh, a week ago, and uh, that individual was saying their concern is it can really uh, help augment research, and uh, one of the things that does is reduce the need for the junior roles. Mm who do that work and, you know, produce a brief and the more experienced uh, lawyers then take that input and apply their experience. And if you're not doing the mm. lower level work, how do you develop that experience? How do you grow in a career? And so I think, you know, there, there are some really interesting areas where, you know, AI is going to simplify roles 
but are um, today's young people who are going to, you know, grow up with it either throughout their career, if they're starting their careers now or, you know, throughout their education and into their career, will necessarily develop different sets of skills and different aptitudes mm. in order to respond. So I think, you know, there's, there's a real opportunity there. Um, I also think that as we think about, you know, how different uh, industries adopt all forms of AI, they will need to be thinking about, you know, what are those set of skills that apply, you know, to the production of the AI output, but then also to the consumption. And so one example of that is we're seeing a lot of examples of improvement in how uh, call centers operate, mm. better access to answers to questions, you know, very rapid uh, processing of knowledge base information so that you can get a really a really quick and really accurate response, which makes the call center operator's job, in fact, easier. So much makes easier. Makes them much more yeah. efficient. It removes bottlenecks and it also allows them to focus, in fact, on that relationship piece, which is which is what people in those roles are there for. And so, you know, I think there's an enormous amount of really positive potential and positive momentum from starting to apply some of these tools and techniques to, to help make our workforce more efficient. And so when we think about, you know, some of these challenging questions that we've um, asked ourselves about society, we should always be thinking about, you know, what are the opportunities that technology give us in order to, you know, improve the um, access to, to different types of work and different types of roles so that people don't get pigeonholed. So that's that's a good segue then into this this world of work, right? So, what's what's your view on AI? So there's two in this context, right? So there's I guess two schools of thought, right? There's the sci-fi dystopian sort of world where Skynet takes over the world, or um, you know, I'm a bit of a sci-fi fan. I like this show, The Expanse. I don't know if you've heard of it, The Expanse. In this world, on Earth, sixty percent of people live on basic income and 40% are allowed to apply for a job. And those 40% are the elites and the 60% will live in this squalor of basic income because AI basically does everything. Is that the future we're looking for or looking towards rather, or is it more a question of those junior roles have been made redundant by AI, but the junior roles now are focused on another form of productivity enhancement or another form of role does it create new roles altogether? So for me, I definitely am in the latter category, right? Every wave- So of no Skynet for you. Every, right. every wave of technology that we have experienced has in fact created a wave of new roles Correct. and has unlocked different forms of productivity. And for me, this is no different. I think what's really important to remember is how do we think about using this technology responsibly? So, you know, when you described dystopia for you, um, if, we, if that's not the world we wanna to move towards, then it's incumbent upon all of us to really think about what are those responsible principles of how we design, build and deploy the underlying technologies that will enable our future. And, you know, by, by thinking through some of those responsible principles, thinking through, you know, the, the outcomes and impact on people by keeping humans in the loop as we start to build these systems and train these models so that we are understanding the outcomes and we're continually evaluating those outcomes against reality, we actually have the ability to shape our future. I agree. I think I, I agree with the view that this is a form of industrial revolution, right? So it, in every stage of our history, there have been there have been vast changes that have displaced some things and created new things, yeah. right? So I, I agree with that view. And, and just for the record, I'm not I, I'm not I'm not advocating just <laughs> you're, you're not uh, taking us down I'm not, into I'm not uh, taking this down an towards a towards alternate a world future of basic income. Um, Although, you know, interestingly, there is a, a policy argument that's being put forward on the idea of universal basic income for this reason, actually, where, you know, people will be displaced by autonomous vehicles or things like that. This is an actual 
area of debate, right? But on, on the regulation side, what I find really interesting is some of the biggest players who you'd think would be really completely pro AI, like Elon Musk and Sam Altman, you know, who was Y Combinator, are actually arguing for regulation of the development of AI because they, for the same reasons that we're saying, they don't want to see a world of a dystopia where AI just displaces a whole bunch of things and we have done it in a way that doesn't actually put the improvement of the human condition first uh, rather than the pursuit of whatever um, whatever other objective there might be. You know? And so, you, of course, you want AI to be part of, of an improvement to productivity, an improvement to wealth creation, an improvement to profit. But if it comes at massive societal expense, that is actually not an improvement of those things. Right? So I, I find it pretty interesting that people like that are arguing for regulation. What does regulation look like for AI? Well, I'm probably not the right person to ask mm. about that. I don't think I am either. I, since, <laughs> since I don't, uh, I don't uh, sit in in government. Um, I think, though, you know, you can very much be pro AI and still accept that regulation is is likely. I mean, our financial markets are regulated. Our, um, you know, we have very, uh, particularly in Australia, you know, our occupational health and safety and well-being uh, regulations are, you know, are very helpful, in fact, for, you know, the overall well-being and, and our businesses thrive in, you know, in the environments mm. that they're in. So, you know, my view would be that, you know, this is, this is another step in, in the evolution of, you know, industry and society. Mm. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And look, markets have always had regulation, right? Um, I, I've always suggested that markets, markets, the, this, where the regulation is set around markets is just basically the rules that, well, um, that govern how we operate within a yeah. particular field, right? So this shouldn't be any different. But I think the interesting thing is we're not entirely sure yet where this is applicable, where AI is applicable, or where it even is. So for example, you know, a, a great friend of mine developed a software that is AI driven, that sits behind, um, uh, that sits behind websites you commonly use. So if you go onto a retailer website and you say you'd like to buy a camera, right? Okay, I'm buying this camera. And then it will automatically say, have you considered this lens cap uh, yeah. thing or this, I'm not a camera person, but whatever other bits go to it. And that whole website is driven by this piece of software that he's invented, right? Um, and it's, you know, extended to all, all sorts of companies. So you'd never know his product actually exists because you as the consumer never interface with his product, you interface with yeah. the retailer's product. So I see those sorts of applications of AI uh, as really interesting. In fact, we have, you know, we've been working for some time here on Podium for Development, which is with, with Accenture as well where as a development manager, one of the worst experiences is going through multitudes of legislation and planning regulation and whatever to try and figure out what you can do with a site. So if you could, you know, now if we can apply the software we're trying to develop properly, I should be able to look at a particular site and say, what am I allowed to do on this site? And it says, well, here's the height limit, here's the zoning, Here's the, you know, here's the sort of yield you can get out of the site. And then I can calculate, okay, if I can do yield on residential or industrial or commercial or whatever it is, what's the highest and best use of the site? And pretty quickly, I can then size up whether it's worth investing in this particular site or not. Whereas before we had software like this, there were versions of it, but it, it became quite a difficult, it was quite a long task mm. to sort of do that. So speeding up that process means transactions can happen faster. It means you can bring in capital faster. It means you can get through a planning process faster. And governments have been on this on this um, journey too with the whole concept of the digital twin yep. for planning, where now in New South Wales actually was well ahead on this, where they've got a digital twin for the state. So now they're expecting you to have a digital twin for every project you put forward so they can assess very easily digitally how your planning um, a building and you can scenario test different heights and scenario test different For sure. yields, and you can all do it online as opposed to you know people drawing things and isn't it incredible how 
a simple technology can cut through so much red tape, right? Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a, like, I love listening to you articulate that story because, you know, in the, the role that I have, a lot of times people come to me and they say, you know, what are, what are the applications of AI? And, you know, I kind of feel a little bit like, well, what do you need to do in your day-to-day -day life? <laughs> that's and right. there is yeah, an yeah. example of, of where, you, where you have an application. And, you know, I think that a lot of, um, of what we're going to see is actually unlocking of capacity, right? Because if you can make an investment decision faster, you can presumably make more investment decisions mm. and therefore increase the overall return on capital. And so if we sort of apply that logic across, you know, every industry, at some point, you know, we we can reach a level of efficiency that also presumably allows us to have a little bit more leisure time. Right. And, um, you know, maybe less waiting time when we're, um, you know, when, when we're waiting for a service or, or something like that, mm. because we've been able to free up and increase the pace. And so I think, you know, there's there's some really interesting opportunities across our entire economy. And if you do have more leisure time, you then start to get into this democratization of the workplace question that we were talking about earlier between, you know, making sure that two working parents both have the chance to get into the office or not, as the case may be, right? And, you know, that's an interesting point, actually. You're an advocate for the four-day working week? The French are? <laughs> I would love to fit my day into a, my, my week into four days. I think... Uh, it never works for me. The, you know what? The, res the research is bearing out that uh, more downtime leads to more productivity. And, you know, if I just experiment on myself, I can assure you that on days when I'm able to get more rest and, you know, a larger gap between, uh, between time at work, I definitely feel more energy. Mm. So You said your children have grown up though, right? Uh, well, they're teenagers. Oh, they're teenagers. Well, that's, not, that's not grown up. That must be exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> But the thing about teenagers is they don't really want to spend very much time with me, so it gives me a lot of free time. It's hilarious. No, I'm not there yet, obviously. But but if I've got less involvement to them to look forward to, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But anyway, we'll see. Oh, look, you know, each phase is each phase is lovely in its own way. Yeah. Let's go to let's go to applications again, because I think that's that's a really interesting discussion. So I you know I've given you some examples of how we're using it here. What are the most exciting applications you've seen that is of... almost the hardest question you could possibly ask me. hey it's <laughs> the point of the show. <laughs> um look i think you know we've talked we've talked a little bit about um you know about some of the public good aspects mm. i think that there is some really incredible um work being done in the field of health healthcare. Mm. um yeah. you know both on the clinical side around being better able to diagnose by you know, using machine learning to, um, to analyze scans and things like that. So you know, there's, there's a lot of, of really positive clinical outcomes that have high potential. Equally, I think there's a huge amount when we go back to the productivity point of, you know, being able to help clinicians with administrative tasks, which means that they can spend their time doing what they were trained to do mm. and, you know, being medical practitioners, being doctors, being nurses and, and doing um, a smaller amount of admin because it is accelerated. So I think that field has has huge potential. I think manufacturing you talked about digital twins, you know, the ability to actually bring a blend of generative AI and analytic AI in into a product design context, into a materials choice context, and really uh, understand lots of different scenarios, understand different, you know, products and, and how they might be manufactured and then uh, take them through to fruition is a really powerful so application. So the design to development process Design to development better. process, yeah. um, you know, re reaching all the way into, you know, application of, of some of the, powering some of the robotic processes that, mm. uh, you know, that are involved in sophisticated manufacturing today. You know, there's a, a really tremendous potential. Um, and look, there's almost not an industry you could pick where mm. uh, where there isn't a really exciting application. It's interesting because you know, we um, we work with SoftBank in, in our Japanese office, who have been a long client of ours. 
and um, and you know I, I get to spend time with them every so often. And one of the things they they talk about is they're they're big on AI, right? And one of the things they talk about is is the demographic challenges Japan is facing mm. means that they have to turn to technology to manage their population because their population is aging. So they're doing that in two ways, right? One is this healthcare question where they can make sure that the people who are working are healthy and they're using AI to improve diagnostic processes or uh, dietary management or you know all that sort of stuff, which is fascinating. Um, but the other thing they're really working on is the idea of a robotic care workforce. Mm. So, you know, uh, robots in aged care homes to make sure people aren't lonely, yeah. which I imagine speaking to an artificial intelligence would actually stop you being lonely, but it, it is because it's sort of becoming more real. Or potentially, you know, again, going back to, to movie references, you know, robots in the home that do home tasks that, you know, create more opportunity for you to go and do other things, right? So, um, and the reason why they're having to go in that direction is because Japan is running out of people, right? Um, yeah, running out of young people. You can sort of see that happen across the board in so many, particularly Western countries that have aging populations, right? So I think AI has this amazing application that we probably have only just scratched the surface of, I suspect, in some of these areas. I would say we're very much at the beginning, right? Mm. And, you know, we, we will unleash a huge amount of creativity, a huge amount of, uh, of, you know, productivity. And, you know, as we create more space for people to, you know, to think and to dream, who knows to some extent what we will dream up, right? I mean, mm. I think that there's, there's a lot of, um, of technologies we use every day today that 20 years ago we probably wouldn't have imagined was the way things would be working. They're quite true. So, yeah. you know, I think, you know, I think we're about to unlock a tremendous potential. Mm. It's interesting, you know, Peter Thiel um, wrote a book called Zero to One, which I don't know if mm. you've read before, but he, um, it's a good book. And one of the things he argues is actually the innovation process in the last two generations has actually been really slow. You know, we were promised during the Jetsons flying cars. We were promised, <laughs> you know, we were promised, you know, interstellar travel. We were promised the moon would be settled by now. And yet these things haven't happened. And one of the reasons for that, he goes into the reasons why he thinks that's happened, um, largely to do with the way we govern ourselves in business is sort of his argument and that we sort of crush innovation. But I think what we're talking about here is potentially the adoption of AI in the workplace and adoption of AI in the home and adoption of AI in, in the way we operate as an economy might actually free up, free up some thinking to allow the, you know, innovation to thrive. Yeah, I think there's an aspect of human nature as well. You know, in the, uh, in the five years between 2017 and 2022, we saw, uh, we measure a disruption index across a, a number of dimensions. And we saw that index uh, jump to 200% disruption during that period. Mm. Now that was the COVID period, right? Yeah. Um, but the five years before that, it sat at around 7%. So yeah. we were in a real steady state and a significant event, an external trigger really, drove an enormous amount of disruption, which I think allowed us to change our mindset in a way, mm. to be willing to accept some of the innovation as well. And I think there's a real, um, a real need for that friction to, to enable us to have the motivation to innovate. So we need more if you're, events. If you're, if you're relaxed and comfortable, well, yes. where's, your, where's your motivation for change? I think that was his argument, right? His argument yeah. as well, it's, all, it's just all a bit too easy, right? Like, has the mobile phone really changed? It's still, you make a call yeah. and you send a message, right? Um, that's been the same for a long time, right? I think that's the argument. I agree with you, actually. I mean, the pandemic really did force us to rethink a lot of things, right? I mean, this whole workplace discussion we were having yeah. earlier, that's all come out of that, right? But no one references the pandemic now when we talk about this, but that's why we have it. Yeah, it right? showed us what was possible, you know, yeah. equally in, in retail, right? You know, mm. a, a lot mm. of retailers 
e-commerce was a sideshow to the main event in store. And then all of a sudden it was the only event mm. for a period of time. And so, you know, there's now a rebalancing, but I think it does force a rethink of, you know, of every business, what does this mean for me? And one of the things that I think AI is doing, and in particular, the, um, you know, the excitement of the adoption of AI today, every business is now saying to themselves, having gone through the, the past, you know, three to five year period, what does this mean? And how do I embrace it? And what do I need to do? And, you know, we are definitely finding that, you know, organizations are saying, you know, what does this mean for my people? Mm. You know, what does this mean for, for my strategy? What does this mean for my enterprise? What does this mean for my, my systems, my data, and, you know, my, my digital core? And how do I need to adapt so that I don't miss out? And I think those sorts of things are, um, you know, they're, they're pretty big questions, mm. each of them, right? Yeah. And so, you know, when you when you think about that, you know, we have the potential to to really unleash an incredible amount of not only change, but you know, innovation, creativity, opportunity. And I guess for me, I, you know, I've sort of spent, you know, I was I was sort of the nerdy kid who kind of, you know, liked liked the computer when it was invented, and yeah. you know, try, tried all all sorts of new things as they as they came out. And I just think the opportunity that we are starting starting at right now is, you know, is is like almost nothing I've seen throughout my lifetime, which mm. is which is pretty exciting. Well, that's the benefit of being the early adopter, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, like I I look at the pandemic actually, and you look at. The beginning of it, and I remember reports that vaccines won't be developed for five, ten years. So get ready, we're going to be living in lockdown forever, right? Was a sort of doomsday view. And the world got together and invented several vaccines within a couple of years. And I don't think we celebrate that quite enough, right? Mm. The ingenuity of the human spirit got us to a position where we got ourselves out of you know, this pandemic. I mean, I, 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 for me, that is sort of alludes to what you've been saying, which is the opportunity is here now. And I'm, yeah. I bet you there was a bunch of AI behind some of that, that, uh, that work. Without, without question. There's mm -hmm. a, a tremendous amount of, you know, the, the analysis and, and the pattern matching that is at its core, the driver of a lot of the algorithms that, that drive today and tomorrow's AI. Mm, indeed. We'll have to end soon. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, if I was to say, if you wanted three things to sort of make, make a step forward with AI, what would they be? Wow. Um, look, I think I'm going to start with culture, um, which is possibly not what anyone would expect from someone <laughs> in my role, to be honest. But I actually think an open mind and a culture that is ready to experiment and adopt is, is probably the first thing. I would love to see that in all parts of society. Um, I think it's hard sometimes mm. to, you know, to, to let go of your anchor and your past. And so I think that culture piece is really important. So that would be my first one. Um, my second one would be a really uh, strong and constructive appetite for investment um, because the reality is in order to embrace the opportunity, we are going to have to make uh, very, um, very structured and meaningful investments, which, you know, can, can be very prudent, right? But. Um, but having that open mind and having that attitude for, for investment uh, and appropriate allocation of capital is, is a really important part of this uh, evolution. And my third wish is that uh, we are able to come together and um, as a society and embrace a set of values around responsible application of this technology because it will take more than any one person to really be thinking about, you know, the ethical deployment, understanding um, how to identify and address biases and to continually test for that, how to ensure that we're inclusive in the application of the technology, that we're not leaving uh, any individuals or groups of individuals behind. 
Um, and that would be my third wish. Mm. Yeah, well, it's fantastic. Kelly Bruff, thank you so much for being part of Smarter Cities. Absolute pleasure, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. Really great discussion. Mm -hmm.